it's time for Fish Facts TV. Welcome to Fish Casting the Fishing Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner of Fish Facts TV. Hello, I'm Captain Tim. All right, guys, we got a good show this week. We both got out and did some good fishing. Um, and we got a good fish of the week, something a little different. We don't have any questions yet, but we may pause in the middle and try to come up with some for ourselves, but we'll see how long we go with everything else. So uh, let's get going. Tim, did you get to do any fishing this week? Yeah, I actually did get out. Um, spent a lot of time on the water on Saturday. Um, I'm usually the type of guy that likes to get out early, get the fish and get back early. But um, I have a fishing tournament that I'm fishing in um, on April 10th, which is a week and a half away. And uh, this upcoming weekend, Easter weekend, I got some commitments at work and family stuff. So I knew I wouldn't be able to fish this upcoming weekend. So I went out and, and targeted uh, um, some fish for an inshore tournament that I'm fishing in. Um, that tournament includes snook, redfish, and trout. Um, it's an all catch and release tournament, obviously, because of we're in catch and release only on those species, but also it's a tournament that's been running for close to 15 years. And I fished in it a number of times. Really, really good tournament for a nonprofit school that's put on. So, um, I took my neighbor out and um, tried to target some of those snook, trout, and reds. Uh, tough, tough bite. I, I mean, I don't know what was going on. We started super early, um, tried to mimic the conditions of the tournament. Um, tournament starts at uh, 6 a.m. So we, we were fishing dock lights before the sun rose, trying to get snook and trout. Um, got a couple nice trout in early. Uh, started fishing some docks that I that have been very productive for me in the past and and depending on what the conditions are the day of the tournament I don't really know yet um, maybe I'll go back there caught a couple snook nothing huge um, around the, the the 24 to 26 inch range I, I think I caught maybe four of them um, went went to try for some redfish and that's always the problem with this tournament for some reason in this tournament I fished it a number of times redfish are the hardest fish for me to get a hold of. Um, so went, went to some of my redfish docks where I've, where I've caught reds before. Nope, snook and trout, snook and trout only. So um, never did catch that redfish, um, hooked a couple really nice fish. I don't know what they were. Um, obviously we're using light tackle, but they got me into the dock and, and broke me off. But I'd love to know what those two really big ones were. Um, so uh, I'm relatively prepared for the tournament. Um, I'd like to convert some of those smaller snook into some big ones over 30 inches to give myself, um, you know, a, a better place for the tournament. But we'll see how that goes. Um, we fish the tournament fish from maybe 6 a.m. to probably just shy of noon. From there, um, at the recommendation of, and what I mentioned on this podcast the other day is that I was going to try pompano fishing. I, I will tell you, I tried pompano fishing for the first time in a while, and I did it for about five minutes, and I got fed up with it, and the king macro bite has been so good recently, and, and the wind was finally letting up that um, the forecast was really weird this whole weekend. It was supposed to be light winds all weekend, but it was blowing. Um, the wind let up a little bit, and uh, my neighbor, who I was fishing with for the first time, we decided to run offshore a little bit, about 15 miles from where we we're at, uh, to try to get on some of these kingfish. We did not get a single kingfish bite. I'm chumming, live chumming. I'm throwing out all sorts of dead baits, getting a good chum slip going. I'm fishing over um, close to some artificial bottom that I've caught tons of kingfish at in the past. Nothing. All I've been hearing all the, all the last two weeks is how good the kingfish bite is. Well, I was pretty humbled when I came to fishing kingfish. We spent probably an hour and a half uh, on two different spots, chumming with tons of live greenbacks, dead greenbacks. All we caught were bottom fish. Um, we did have one king come and, come and uh, um, hit one of the chummers that I threw on top. Wasn't a big king, maybe 10 pounds, but um, ended being really, really, really tough. So from there, we went back in shore. I was gonna try a couple of different sets of docks now that it was high tide. and. Um, my windlass ended up having an issue. Uh, my switch started going out and I, and I got a double wrap on it. 
Uh, for those that don't know, windlass is an um, electronic device that pulls your anchor in for you. So that got all fouled up and, and from there we called it a day, went back to the house to fix the windlass and clean the boat. So um, all in all, I, I didn't have the best day fishing. We, we caught a lot of fish, wasn't the, the caliber of fish I would have liked for the tournament, but it gives me a decent idea on um, where I can go to at least get some nice trout. And um, if I need somehow need to put a snook, um, um, in for the tournament, I, I know I can go down there and catch some on the small side, hopefully on the bigger side. So that was that was my fishing day. It was a long day, stayed out to almost five o'clock, um, which I rarely, rarely do. So um, definitely, definitely a long, arduous day on the water, but had a great time. Yeah, th those days are always kind of bittersweet where you catch a lot of fish, but it's never, you never have that hot moment or that hot half an hour where you're really catching them. So when you look back at the day, it seems like you had a good day, but in the moment, you never really feel like you had that, that day. Now you said you caught four snook early. How many snook, how many trout do you think you caught all together? Um, I probably caught about seven snook myself, um, all the same size. I mean, carbon copies one after the next. Um, and we, we caught a bunch of trout. Um, Trouting around the 15 inch range, we probably caught about 10 together. And then um, in the 15 to 20 inch range or 16 to 20 inch range, we probably caught about five combined for the boats. So not the biggest trout ever. Um, would, would like, I'd like to get some over 20 for the tournament for sure. You know, in that tournament, there's a lot of local guides and, and it's been going long enough that people know about it. Um, I think the, the, you know, to, to do well for the overall aggregate score, you're gonna need a snook probably 34 inches or bigger, a redfish at least 24 inches and a trout over 20 to, to come close to uh, you know, first, second or third place. Um, it does have individual um, prize categories, biggest overall snook, trout and redfish not entered into the, uh, the cup. So if you get all three, you're entered into the cup. So um, I've won individual uh, a, a number of times, a bunch of different times for, for snook and trout. Haven't ever done well with the reds. Like I said, for some reason, uh, I can never seem to catch reds when I need to for this tournament, but um, it's, it's a great tournament and I'm excited to uh, participate again. Yeah, fishing tournaments is never really, I've never done a ton of it, but, but there is sort of an added excitement when you have that competitiveness uh, that's associated with the tournament. Yeah, as a com really competitive guy, um, I like ramp up to, to be even more competitive. Um, I feel like the pressure is totally on. Um, this year I'm fishing with a different team um, than I have before. Uh, I've usually fished for, um, with a different team, captaining their boat for them, but um, they're, they're uh, not able to do it this year. So I'm gonna be on my boat. So my boat, my rules, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, well, uh, it sounds like a lot of fun, and, and I, I wish you guys the best luck. Um, you know, hopefully this weekend you can at least get out there for a little bit. I know, like you said, with Easter, I, I'm, I'm taking my family out uh, in Fort Lauderdale, so it's gonna, they're, they're coming down here to South Florida, but, but it, it's always nice to have a, a good family holiday, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited with everything going on. You know, we haven't, we haven't really had many true family holidays. Most of my family, I'm the only one that's uh, not vaccinated, not trying to get political, but um, out of my whole family. So, so everyone's vaccinated except for me. And uh, it'll be nice to get together and uh, um, at least see each other on Easter. And, and uh, if we wrap up early, maybe I can go throw some jigs or something and prepare for this tournament. But uh, I think you had a pretty, uh, crazy week going down, hanging out with some friends and, and wetting a line. Uh, what, what do you got to say about that? Yeah, I, I went down to Key West uh, to go see some friends and I, I was able to sneak in two fishing trips on the way down. I don't know if you recall my last uh, Keys trip. I only <laughs> bought three. I can't remember. Was it three or <laughs> ten fish? It was three. It was three. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> so uh, this time I decided to buy a dozen. Um, and I thought that might be more of a round number and man, it was instant. 
Um, I got to the bridge shortly after sunrise. Within probably five minutes, I had my first fish on. Um, I don't know if that first one was a jack or something else. It went out and out and out. And I thought I had it back in around that piling. And right when I had enough line in, it cut left and right towards the piling. As soon as the braid hits the piling, it get off. And, and I, mind you, this is an 8,000 reel. I'm cupping the spool just to get line in. You know, I have 50 pound line, 50 pound leader with, you know, thick, thick hooks. So second, um, few minutes later, bam, another one. Um, do, doesn't fight as hard. I get it up pretty quick. It's probably about a four or five pound yellow jack. So um, doesn't have the horsepower of those big, you know, eight, nine pound jack corrals, but was nice to pull up. And then, you know, probably in the next 30, 45 minutes, I caught two more corvals in that eight, nine, 10 pound range and had another one or two more um, break off or some of them, the hook was just pulling because, you know, when you have that much drag, um, you know, sometimes their mouths just rip through. So I had one where I thought I had it and it just ripped out. Um, went through a little low, um, didn't get anything for a minute. And then um, one of our other mutual friends came by on our way down and I got him on one. Um, and that last one, we weren't able to get it in the pier net. It kind of got its head in, but I shortened the line a little bit and I just couldn't get it around uh, in time. So he ended up like the teeth just rubbed through the leader. But I mean, we had it up you know, if we would have been in a boat, we easily would have gotten it. It's just getting it up on that bridge uh, can be a little tricky. But uh, yeah, it was a successful trip. Three nice jack corvals, um, one yellow jack, a couple little chubs and stuff. But I find it very odd that there's just not very many snapper uh, in that area, or at least not during the daytime. Yeah, were, were you at the Long Key Bridge again? I know that that, uh, that was the spot you mentioned before and you fished there before. Is that the Long Key Bridge you're at, Tanner? Yeah, Long Key Bridge. Yeah, um, well, silver lining. I, I know last time you were really looking for one of those yellow jacks and you got one pretty quick. It seems like uh, this time, did, did you keep that sucker or, or no? No, I didn't. We were headed down to Key West and I actually ended up giving two of the Jack Rivals away. Uh, the two that I got up to the to the bridge, but the yellow jack, no one was there yet. You know, it was so early. I was the only person on the pier, so I just uh, let her to go to swim another day. Yeah, no, I, I, that's for the best. If you're not going to eat it or or you can't give it to someone fresh, now, what do you think that that first fish was? I mean, it sounds like a real dandy. You're, you're palming the spool, and you got you know obviously a good tackle, heavy heavy stuff for, for those conditions. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, that sounds sounds like a real bruiser. Yeah, you, you never know down there. You know, obviously jack valves are probably the most common, but tarpon, big grouper, mutton snapper, kubera snapper, you know, th there's all sorts of big fish that live out there that can do that. I, I mean, even permit, I, I'm thinking uh, I might go back tomorrow and buy a couple crabs. I saw a guy the other day pull a permit out of the channel two bridge. So I do believe that there's more permit on channel two, but uh, I may try to drop a crab down there just to see what happens. Yeah, that sounds cool. I know that uh, you know, those permit are awesome fish. We've talked about them. Uh, they can pull quite hard. So uh, that would be awesome if you get a permit. Yeah, I've, I've never got one. So uh, we'll have to see and uh, I'm excited to try it. No, um, you mentioned uh, you were able to fish on the way back. Did, did, was that successful at all, or or was it just the first trip on the way down? So the the second trip, I actually fished in Mallory Square, uh, oh. best historical carnival area. Um, the I went there. I've been there twice before. Once during spring break in college, and during my anniversary in June. When I was there in June, I was getting a lot of small. Um, yellowtails and lane snappers. But this time I, I brought some chum. I thought maybe I'd be able to bring up some bigger yellowtails and I was right. Um, two yellowtails that were nearly keepers. I, I think one of them may have been a keeper, 
Um, and there was a lot of mangrove snappers in the chum. I think I caught four or five mangrove snappers. The biggest was probably nine inches. So I only had about an hour to fish and the, the bait shop had no live bait. So I was just using dead mm -hmm. shrimp, but I, I made the mess, best of it. I think I cut about five yellowtails, five mangroves and a, a hodgepodge of random chubs, grunts, pork fish. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't great, but considering uh, how wild the night was before and how little time I had and I didn't even have the bait that I wanted, um, I, I think I definitely made the most of it. Yeah, I, I'd say that's definitely a success. Now, was it super busy down there? When I've been down in Mallory Square, there's just people everywhere. Was it, was it pretty packed? No, first thing in the morning, it's really not crowded at all. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting, so I was fishing yellowtail jigs on top and I was fishing with a little uh, quarter ounce sinker um, and a small hook on the bottom. I was actually getting the yellowtails on the bottom and the mangroves on the top, which is you know traditionally opposite of what I've seen. Um, usually you get mangroves on the bottom and yellowtails on the top. I could see tons of mangroves in the water and I think if I would have had live shrimp, um, I probably could have gotten more of those bigger mangroves. But those dot snapper like that are very, very wary. Yeah. Um, when I've been down there, I, you know, you can see the fish sometimes, like just swimming around. It, it's, it's pretty wild. I, that's an awesome part of the world to be in. And, uh, you know, my, my biggest question for the whole thing is, was the cat guy there? Did you see <laughs> the cat guy I, at any I point imagine in time? the cat guy was still sleeping when I was there. So, you know, I probably should have been still sleeping, but uh, um, no, no cat guy. I also saw a big Goliath grouper took a swing at uh, my chub actually. And he, he didn't get it, you know, it wasn't a big Goliath grouper. It was probably 10, 15 pounds. So on the scale of Goliath groupers, not very big, but on the scale of just about anything else, you know, it was a, a big fish to just attack one of these. Uh, I think he first went after a yellowtail and then went after a, a chub, but he managed not to get either. Were you keeping it away from that Goliath or, or were you trying to get him to eat just so you could catch a bigger fish? Um, you know, I wasn't pulling it away as fast as I could, um, if, if that's what you're asking. But uh, he he or she just wasn't uh, wasn't that hungry. I mean, even one of the fish that was gut hooked ended up throwing back in and it just sunk down. It, it didn't look like, looks like he kind of came and surveyed the scene and then uh, decided that it wasn't for him that day. Well, it's still a really cool interaction to see a, a fish like that come up and say, hey, while you're catching these other fish. Uh, and, and especially being in like such a pretty area, you got to see a bunch of fish, catch a bunch of fish. Uh, that's cool. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, uh, next thing we're gonna talk about is our fish of the week. Um, those of you who don't traditionally listen to our podcast, maybe you're listening because you just saw this um, in, in the headline. This fish of the week is the striped bass, Marone saxatillus, I believe. Um, Tim, what, what can you tell us about uh, striped bass? Striped bass, um, I don't have a whole lot of experience catching stripers. Um, I'm, I actually am drawing a blank at where I was um, when I had my only experience catching them. It was, I believe, a lake in Georgia when I was a kid. But um, as a fellow who doesn't do a whole lot of freshwater fishing, um, especially in, you know, what I'd like to say, like populated areas of striped bass, I don't have a whole lot to say. I know that they get huge, you know, up in the Northeast, people get them in salt water. Um, I know that they are highly targeted. There's a lot of tournaments that revolve around the striped bass. The striped bass fishing industry is booming. So that, I, I don't know a whole lot. Um, I'd love to learn. What, what do you got, Tanner? So I, I lived in New York for a couple of years. Um, I was never a die hard striped bass fisherman, but, but I've caught them on a handful of occasions. Um, when I was living in lower Manhattan, I used to throw a little jig sometime by my apartment and I, and I cut a couple little small, you know, 10, 12 inches uh, doing that. Um, but the, the biggest one I ever caught was probably about 15 pounds. Um, and that was under the Throgs Neck Bridge in the Bronx. And there was a head boat that left out of Manhattan and they would just go fish under the bridges at night with live eels. 
And that's how I caught my big striper. And man, that, that 15 pound striper uh, put up quite the fight. Um, it, it was a beautiful, great fighting fish. Um, definitely uh, uh, the prize probably of that year of fishing, you know, the, the best fish I caught. Uh, you know, here in Florida, they, they say they actually get them in the St. John's River in certain times of the year. I personally never caught one um, uh, oh, in the rivers in Florida. I have caught some in, uh, in a stocked lake that had them uh, near Jacksonville. And I do know that Lake Ida, which is a lake here near uh, Boca or Deerfield Beach, somewhere up in that like north of Fort Lauderdale, south of Palm Beach area, the, the FWC actually stocks hybrid stripers there. And I fished there for them twice because th that lake is really cool because you can get largemouth bass, hybrid striped bass, peacock bass, um, and those, uh, what do they call them? I always forget, clown knife fish, all yeah. in the same lake. Yeah, Lake Ida is a cool spot. Um, I've never personally fished there, but it's definitely a place that, you know, if you want to branch out, catch some exotics and, and do something different, you know, I, I'd love to get down there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But um, just, just more on the factual end, those striped bass can live in freshwater and saltwater. They have a wide temperate range all the way from Canada down to Jacksonville area and then in the Northern Gulf as well. And I, I think a lot of times they spawn up in the freshwater and then the big ones come out uh, in the saltwater during the year. I actually saw a guy one time in Manhattan near where I fished, like a local pull about a 40 pounder uh, right off the shore on the, on the south tip of Manhattan. Yeah, that, that's just crazy. Um, I've, I've seen tons of pictures, especially from tournaments and, and the charter boat guys that go out and just catch these absolute slobs. Um, I'd love to do it. It's not at the top of my list, but uh, I, I definitely want to get on a hot striper bike because people say they're just so much fun to catch. Absolutely. All right, uh, for this week's question of the week is actually something I've seen in an online petition floating around regarding the clown knife fish, uh, the one I referred to in Lake Ida. There's actually a lot of controversy whether or not they should be considered a uh, non-invasive game fish like the peacock bass. Um, it, it all started out, some guys, I guess, were doing a YouTube video bow hunting and they shot like 20 or 30 of them. And a lot of the locals that live in that area really love catching them. Um, I've personally been up there, caught them once. They're a lot of fun. Um, but Tim, what do you think? Should should the clown knife fish remain a invasive so there's no limits on keeping them? Or, or should they make it a game fish like the peacock bass so they can put a limit on them? Yeah, this, this is a really tough one, I, you know, for a number of reasons. I'm not super familiar with the clown knife fish fishery. I, I know they're down there. I know that they're really cool looking, exotic looking, um, just, just a wacky fish. It can swim backwards. It can do some crazy things. And I encourage people that don't know what we're talking about to look them up. But I, I generally kind of stay the course and I'm a broken record when it comes to uh, invasive or non-native species, especially in Florida. We're just a, a hodgepodge of just so many different things that were brought here and introduced um, either purposefully or by accident that just thrive here in this environment and, and end up negatively impacting the, the local species. So, you know, on this one, just because I'm not super educated on it and, I, and I'm not really familiar with the fisheries, I'm just going to kind of stay the course and say that, you know, I think that as an invasive species, they should be you know, treated as one. And, and I don't think that they should be given a protected status, but I don't have a lot of grounds to back that up right now. Um, so, you know, but that, that's where I stand with my uneducated answer. What do you think? Um, I think that there is a case to be made that we should give them that protected status. You know, in a lot of states, like in California, largemouth bass are non-native, yet they're allowed to you know, have limits in the Northeast. Brown trout are non-native. So it, it's not totally unprecedented. Um, obviously in Florida, we have the peacock bass. They also have those uh, big grass carps. And you could say those stripers, but the thing about the, the grass carps and the stripers is they're infertile. 
Whereas obviously these clown knives are a self-sustaining population. My thoughts on it, on it are, if we wanna do that, then I think we need to do some research first. I think that, you know, maybe it is sad that these people killed that many of them. Maybe they shouldn't, maybe they should. I don't know. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are just saying, oh, they're fun to catch. Therefore it should be illegal to keep that money. Um, but but I, I feel like those people should talk to some local fisheries biologists and try to petition them to do some kind of study or even maybe their petition will have the FWC back a study because I, I really feel like we need some research to see what they're doing to the ecosystem before we jump to the conclusion that uh, we should start regulating them. Yeah, I think there's no question about that. I mean, there definitely needs to be some sort of fisheries impact study before anyone um, really has any grounds to to make any decisions on these fish. Just, you know, that we, there's not enough data out there. And, and if there is, I, I certainly don't know about it. All right, Tim, um, I think we're going to wrap it with that. Um, I think we had a good episode. Remember, five stars on iTunes, leave us a review. And uh, if you have any questions, Instagram, um, or, or I'll post them up. Um, yeah. No, thanks everybody for listening. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if I'm able to get out and do some more tournament prep and uh, I'll report back either way, definitely. And uh, hope everyone has a great week. Sounds good. Have a good one.